Now, the rest of the story. So how many of you recognize that voice? Some of you maybe uh, who might be a, a little bit older, you, you recognize the voice, maybe you remember hearing that on the radio. That is none other than Paul Harvey, not Steve Harvey. That's another guy who sort of made a name for himself. Paul Harvey was a nationally recognized radio broadcaster, a news columnist who was known for his storytelling delivery style of the news and current events, his conservative viewpoints, and he began his radio career, as you could say, at an early age. At 14, Paul Harvey began to work at a radio station in Tulsa doing voiceovers. He would later go on to study at the University of Tulsa briefly before quitting college to go into radio full-time. And now most of us, we would think, you know, that's a poor decision. If, if you have a child in college and they came to you at the end of the freshman year and, you said, and they said, you know, I think I'm going to drop out of college and go into something I really know little about, or I'm just going to go off on this, you'd be like, well, I don't know so much about that. But it worked out for him. It was really a good decision because over the span of his career, through a mix of his current event delivery, his human interest anecdotes, and just common sense editorialism, Paul Harvey reached over 24 million Americans across 1,600 radio stations every single week. He became known for that signature voice and that signature line. You know, a lot of TV personalities and, and radio broadcasters, they, they develop their own line, their signature line. And Paul Harvey's actually was the title of one of his most famous segments and what we just heard him say, the rest of the story. And so he would begin a broadcast telling a story, and as he went into a break, he would say, and in a minute, or when we come back, the rest of the story. And he would finish his story, and he would often reveal certain Parts of the story that hadn't really been known, facts that people didn't know or weren't aware of. He would add perspective in a way that hadn't previously been considered. And so he would conclude this storytelling time with the line, Now you know the rest of the story. Today's Easter Sunday. And while certainly this could be its own standalone message, for those of us who have been here for the last four weeks, it's going to be somewhat of a continuation of the story that we've been telling. We concluded a series last Sunday called Journey to the Cross, and we were simply looking at some of the major turning point events of the last hours of Jesus' life. It started there in John chapter 13, when Jesus began to meet with his disciples in that upper room to celebrate their final Passover together. And as everyone got settled in, it says that Jesus went over to the corner of the room and basically picked up a basin of water and a towel, and he began to wash his disciples' feet in a picture of service. And so he represented that event with a towel. Later on during the meal, Jesus would identify his betrayer, Judas Iscariot, by dipping a piece of bread and giving it to him. We talked about the bread of betrayal. Later that night, Jesus would find himself being arrested and hauled in front of Pilate, the Roman governor, the high priests, other accusers, for a trial by night that we represented by a gavel. And then finally, our journey took us to, hence the title, the cross. That universal symbol of an instrument of torture, death, and punishment that has become in our day a worldwide recognized symbol of hope and salvation for millions around the world. And so while we discussed Jesus' crucifixion last week, which is called Palm Sunday, the actual event would have taken place on Friday, this past Friday, the Friday that we refer to as 
Good Friday. And so on that Friday, the journey to the cross would come to a conclusion. And here's what Luke says about the final moments of Jesus' life. Luke 23, 40, uh, 23 verse 46, it says that Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Now my question for you today is what's next? You know, is that the end of the story? Is that all there is to it? Now, most of you would say, well, of course not. We know the rest of the story. But imagine for a moment if you didn't. Just pretend for a moment that you have never heard the story of Jesus. You don't know what happens next. How would you write it? If someone said, you tell me what you think comes next, what would you say? What turn might the story take? Or would you just assume that that's the end of the story? Would you even consider that there is any more to the story and you would just stop right there? Have you heard what other people say about the story? What do they believe happens next? But you see, as Bible-believing Christians and followers of Christ, we know what happens next. We believe that Jesus died on a cross, was buried, was placed in a tomb, and then what? What happened next? He rose from the dead. So write this down. That is the story of the resurrection. That's what comes next for us. That's what we believe. That's why we're here today to to celebrate together on Easter Sunday the resurrection story. But understand this morning that not everyone believes the resurrection story. Not everyone believes that this actually happened, that it was a historical event. That there are plenty of evidences to, to prove the factual bodily resurrection of Jesus. They didn't believe it then, and they don't believe it now. You see, from the moment Jesus was placed in the tomb, all the way up until this very day, there have been false theories that have floated around about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I just want to mention a few of them. One is called the swoon theory or the resuscitation theory. It just simply says that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. But after so much torment and and trauma to his body, he lost consciousness. They thought he was dead, laid him in the tomb, and after some rest, he resuscitated. He came to, gathered his wits about him, and escaped. Now, for those of us who believe in the actual Uh, event of the resurrection, we think, well, that's just ridiculous. And, And indeed it is. It is ridiculous because, one, it assumes that there's no evidence to support an alternative theory, that the actual resurrection, but then it also assumes just absolute incompetence on the part of the Roman soldiers. Now, I'm not here to celebrate them and applaud them. They they were cruel and torturous men. But they were professionals at what they did. They knew what their job was, and they did it every single time. In fact, the Bible tells us that the Roman guards shoved a spear into the side of Jesus as he still hung on the cross just to verify that he was dead. So this idea that he was not, and then later somehow came to and escaped, is not even plausible. Some people also uh, suggest what's called a hallucination theory. It is what it sounds like, that people didn't actually see a resurrected Jesus, that they were hallucinating. They thought they saw Jesus. All of these appearances was just a figment of their imaginations, 
their hopes running wild. And maybe you could make the case if we were talking about just one or, or two or a handful of people smoking mushrooms or something. I don't know. But we're not. We're talking about hundreds of people at different locations, at different times, under different circumstances. And they all claim to have seen the very same Jesus. In fact, Paul mentions that there was one occasion where over 500 people were gathered together at one time in one place and they all saw the very same Jesus. Were they all hallucinating? Were they all just imagining things? So we can put that particular theory, I think, to rest. In the place of it, some would come along and say, well, maybe it wasn't a hallucination. It was an impersonation. Someone was pretending to be Jesus. Maybe there was someone, you know, they say we all have a look-alike somewhere on earth. Maybe it was someone who looked like Jesus. And that particular person went around claiming they were Jesus, claiming that they had risen from the dead. Again, is this one person able to fool not just a handful or a few of people, but hundreds of people? Would this person be able to persuade And fool his very own disciples who were obviously, yeah, overwhelmed with fear and doubt. But they had spent over three years of their life every single day with this man. Would they not recognize him if they saw him again? Well, of course they would. And what about the wounds in his hands, in his feet, in his side? Can you pretend those? Can you impersonate those? You'll remember that one of his appearances was in the upper room... With Thomas there, we've come to uh, call him Doubting Thomas because he couldn't believe his own eyes. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, come here. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You see this place where they stuck me with that spear? Put your hand right there, Thomas, and believe. Could someone really pull that off? Doubtful. Others would simply suggest that the resurrection was sort of a spiritual event. The spiritual resurrection theory. It wasn't physical. It wasn't a bodily resurrection. It was all spiritual in nature. Well, let's just take that for a moment and assume that, it, that it's true. If the resurrection was just spiritual in nature, and it wasn't a bodily resurrection, then where is Jesus' body? In 2,000 years plus, no one's found it. Where did it go? If it was only spiritual in nature, and Jesus didn't actually physically rise from the dead, then why, when he met with his disciples after the resurrection... Why did he eat with them? How could he do so? How did people actually touch him if it wasn't a real bodily resurrection? Then you have the theft theory. Like this one started floating around very early. No more had Jesus' body been laid in the tomb and this idea that his disciples would come and steal the body and claim that he was risen from the dead, started immediately. I can somewhat understand the thoughts that this might happen, that this could possibly be something that would, that would take place. you got a group of hopeful disciples. Their dreams seemingly have been shattered. But, but they want to have an impact in the world. I, I could see them attempting perhaps to do so. But, but it's not the case. And some of the evidence that I would point to as to why it's not, and I don't believe that it is, one is simply the persecution that followed. You see, not many years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, when the, the church began to organize and grow, the first part of the book of Acts, very early persecution breaks out against the church. In other words, heads start rolling. Because of people preaching in the name of Jesus, claiming that he had risen from the dead. Now perhaps you could get a few people 
who were radical enough to die for something that they knew was a lie and they could not in any way prove to be true. But let me ask you this. If you were a part of that group, when the sword was put to your throat, would you be willing to die for something that you knew was a lie? Most of us wouldn't. I feel like someone very early on would have said, you know what? This isn't worth it. I'm not carrying on this charade anymore. Jesus is just as dead today as he was the day of crucifixion. Thomas, he hid his body in the closet somewhere. Like, I would rat everybody out. I'm not dying for that. But that didn't happen. Men and women were willing to go to their death for their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. And then you have, and this one's just absolutely preposterous, but I'm going to say it anyway, the unknown tomb theory. Some suggest that, well, maybe the disciples just didn't know where the tomb of Jesus was. So that's why they couldn't find him. And when Peter rushed to the tomb after hearing that he had risen, Again, not knowing where he was going and unsure of which tomb it might be, he ran into the wrong tomb. And, of course, he assumed there it's empty. He must have risen from the dead. That's just stupid. Can we say that on Easter? I mean, it is. Because think about it for a moment. You've witnessed Jesus die on the cross. The Gospel of John and Luke tell us that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea both approached Pilate, got permission to take the body of Jesus when it was removed from the cross, and they placed his body in Joseph's own tomb. So there you have at least two people who know exactly which tomb it is. What's to stop them from sharing that information with others and giving good direction? However, you remember I said that this idea about the disciples... Stealing the body came about very early. Well, just as soon as Jesus was buried, the religious crowd went to Pilate and said, you know, we've heard that quite possibly his disciples, they may try to steal the body and claim he rose from the dead. So could you help us out there? They sent not just one or two Roman guards, but a whole gaggle. You know how many that is? A lot. All right. This, like, the, the grounds were covered with Roman guards. So it's like, even if you hadn't heard where the tomb was, but you wanted to find out, just look for the guards. It's pretty simple. So there's no way that the disciples would not have known where he was located or that they would have gone to the wrong tomb. It's fairly obvious to me that each of these theories are false and deceptive attempts to conceal the truth. To cover up what really happened. And so as Paul Harvey would say, and now for the rest of the story. Following the placing of Jesus' body in the tomb, which again would have occurred on Friday. We read in Luke 24... Starting in verse 1, what happened next? It says, On the first day of the week, that's Sunday, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. How do we know? Why do we believe that Jesus really rose from the dead, physically, bodily, and that he is still alive today. How do we know those things? Rather than just accepting one of these alternative beliefs 
or just denying the resurrection altogether. Why and how do we believe this? Well, here's how the writer of Acts, who is actually Luke, responds to that question in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Luke says, after his suffering, he presented himself. He showed himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. If I were interviewing Luke, perhaps my follow-up question to his answer would be, to whom did Jesus appear? And what are the proofs that he is actually alive? Who saw him? And what evidence can they give that it was him? Who's to say, Luke, that his disciples and some early believers didn't conspire together and come up with this story and make these false claims? Well, again, let's think about that. Let's pause. Give it some consideration. It would be plausible if we were talking, again, about a small group of people who were making this claim. Maybe a handful or a half a dozen or so, but we're not. We're talking about hundreds of people. All who claim to have seen, heard, and some of them even touched the resurrected Jesus. The Bible records no less than 12 post-resurrection appearances. I don't have room for this in your, in your notes, but just let me run down through those real quick. So you can see the variety of people and places and circumstances under which Jesus presented himself. Mary Magdalene in Matthew or John chapter 20. The three women in the garden, we just read about that. Mary, the mother of James, Salome and Joanna, that's Matthew 28. Peter, who ran to the tomb found it empty, later saw Jesus, Luke chapter 24. Two disciples that were on their way uh, to Emmaus, the road to Emmaus, Luke 24. The disciples, when they were gathered together in the upper room, once without Thomas present, another time with Thomas, when he asked him to look at his hands and put his hand in his side. You find that in John 20. There were seven disciples together by the Sea of Galilee in John 21 when Jesus appeared to them. On a mountainside in Galilee, Matthew 28. Again, Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, an instance where over 500 people witnessed the resurrected Jesus all at the same time. And now understand that when Paul wrote the book of, or the letter we call it, of 1 Corinthians This was some 20 years after the resurrection. And you know what he says about those 500 people who witnessed that event? He said, some of them are still alive. So what Paul is saying is, if you don't believe me, if you can't take my word for it, go ask them. Because they're still living. Of course, Paul himself witnessed the risen Savior in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. James, the half-brother of Jesus. And then finally, in Scripture, we come to the book known as the book of Revelation, which is a description of John's vision, John's seeing of Jesus, the risen Savior, who says, I am alive forevermore. So, that's the story of the resurrection. Like those are the facts. But we're not here today just to celebrate the facts, are we? We're not here because of a really good story. What's most important today as we celebrate Easter, write this one down, is the significance of the resurrection. What it means. What it proves to us. You see, the resurrection proves that Jesus was and is who he claimed to be. The resurrection proves that Jesus can and will do what he claimed he could do. I mean, just consider with me for a moment 
the magnitude, the impact of the resurrection. For one, the resurrection proves Jesus' divinity. It proves that he's God. I, I don't want you to take what I'm about to say the wrong way or, or in any way minimizing the death of Jesus. That is a significant event. The fact that Jesus died on the cross. We celebrate. We just sang about that. But here's the thing. Again, there's a lot about the, the cross aspect that points us toward the identity and the, the deity of Christ. I mean, one being prophecies that, I mean, just couldn't be fulfilled by coincidence. No one would find it possible to control or coordinate the events of Jesus' death. However, all of that aside... The simple fact that Jesus died on the cross does not prove he's God. You, you with me? Thousands of people died on crosses. I'm sure that there were many of them who were crazy enough to even claim that they were God. So just the simple fact that Jesus died on the cross doesn't necessarily lead us to that conclusion. But when you add to it the evidence of his resurrection, it's undeniable. He fulfilled the prophetic words of his crucifixion. Added to that the proofs of his resurrection. And you cannot get around the fact that Jesus Christ is the true living God in the flesh. Now add to that another element. He's the only one that's ever rose from the dead by his own power. Because see, there, there have been other people all throughout Scripture that were resurrected. The prophets Elijah and Elisha rose people from the dead. Jesus himself performed resurrections. Remember Lazarus, John chapter 11? But all of them were resurrected by someone else's power. Not to add they all died again too. But Jesus is the only one in all of human history. Who has or ever will rise under his own power. Never to die again. That's what the resurrection proves. Only God can do that. And because he is God. The resurrection also proves that Jesus has the power to forgive sin. Like, this is one of the things throughout the ministry of Jesus that seemed to infuriate the religious crowd more than anything else. Mark chapter 2 is one of the instances where we find this take place. A group of guys have a friend of theirs who's paralyzed. And they desperately want to get their friend in front of Jesus because they believe if they can get him there, that he can be healed of his paralysis. Jesus is teaching in this small house, and people have crowded into this house as tight as they can get. They're crowding the outside of the house. Any glimpse of Jesus, if they can just get within earshot. So it's elbow to elbow, and there's no way in. So these friends devise a plan. They climb up on top of this person's roof, and they begin to dig through. Now just imagine if that was your house. You probably wouldn't appreciate that, would you? But they start digging through this person's roof and they get a hole big enough to lower their friend down through the roof until he comes to rest right in front of Jesus. In verse 5 of that story, it says that Jesus looked at the man and he saw their faith and said to him, what do you think he said? Like, get up and walk? No, he didn't. He said, your sins are forgiven. Well, that's, un that's sort of unexpected. We were hoping for a healing. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. I imagine you could hear a pin drop. Because here's how the religious group that was there that day responded. Verse 6 of Mark 2. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? It's like, who does he think he is? He's blaspheming. 
Who can forgive sins but God alone? Let's answer that question. Who can for, forgive sin except God? Any ideas? Is there anyone who can forgive sin other than God? Is there any of us who have the ability to totally absolve anyone in the world of their sin? No. Only God can forgive and cleanse of sin. So then, here's what happens next. To prove that not only was he God, but being God, he had the power to forgive sin. Jesus did what they had originally hoped for and expected. He turns to the man again. He says, okay, so that everybody will know that I have the power to forgive sin, rise up and walk. The man picked up his mat and walked out the front door. The resurrection proves that he is God. And because he is God, it proves that he has the power to forgive sin. He has the power to forgive my sin. And your sin. You see, that's something to be thankful for. That's something to celebrate today because in Paul's uh, case for the resurrection back in 1 Corinthians 15, listen to what he says in verse 17. If Christ had not been risen, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sin. Why? Because he wouldn't be God and he wouldn't be able to forgive your sin. But I'm thankful today we... We celebrate, we worship a risen Savior with the ability to cleanse and purify of our sin. Something else the resurrection proves is that Jesus has the power over death. That's obvious, right? But it's something to, to think about. It's something to consider. The Bible says that Jesus died once for the sin of all. And he rose from the dead, and unlike others who were resurrected, never to die again. Romans 6, verse 9. He rose from the dead, never to die again. Which simply means that death has no power over him. Death has no hold on him. But it's not only Christ's victory. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 54, death is swallowed up in victory. It's not only Christ's victory. We need to realize that's our victory. He did that for us. What he accomplished there, he gives to us who come to him in faith and put our hope and trust in him. Paul goes on in verse 57 to say, Thanks be to God, he gives us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus not only had victory over death. But to all of those who come to him in faith. He gives victory over death. Listen to me. There's going to come a day. When every single one of us in here. Every single person watching online. Is going to die. I, I realize we don't like to think about that very often. And we wish it weren't so. But it is. It's not an age thing. Let's understand. From the youngest to the oldest, we will all meet the same end. The Bible says that it's appointed unto man to die. It's going to happen. But those who die with Christ as their Savior have this hope that one day, just like his, our bodies will be raised from the grave to glory, never to die again. That's the victory and the power that Jesus secured for us over death, but not only over death, but finally over his enemy. The resurrection proves Jesus' victory over his enemy. From the moment of his original rebellion to the day of the cross, I believe that Satan has viciously 
cunningly and maliciously fought to overthrow the kingdom of God. Now, his fatal flaw was not realizing that he is no equal with God. You see, sometimes we, we even get confused and somehow think that perhaps Satan is God's cosmic equal and they are locked in this you know, ongoing battle for supremacy. Not the case. Not only is Satan not God's equal, he's not even a close match. Nevertheless, he continues to fight. And I can imagine on that Friday afternoon when Jesus breathed his last and his body was placed in that tomb, the devil thought, I got him. I got him. I have dealt the final and decisive blow. But what he didn't realize, while all of hell celebrated, it was heaven's triumph. It was heaven's victory. Because what that meant was the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 had come to pass. Where God said to Eve, as a result of sin, and he said to the serpent, The woman's seed, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. You see, when Jesus said, it's finished, he wasn't talking about his life. He wasn't talking about his ministry. He wasn't talking about his hopes and his dreams. He was talking about that battle. What Satan thought he had won, Jesus said, oh no, it's over. It's done. Your head, though you don't realize it yet. You ever seen a snake squirm even after you crushed its head? Yeah, even though you're still squirming, you're dead. You just don't know it yet. You've been defeated. It is over. So that's why Jesus could say to the sister of Lazarus in John chapter 11, there in verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die physically. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. You see, because Jesus rose from the dead and has victory over his enemy, it means I don't have anything to be afraid of. With a relationship with Christ, in faith, in what he's done for me, and in his power, I don't have anything to fear. Satan can cause me no harm. There's no need for me or, or anyone else to have a concern in the world, a worry in the world about him. And so Paul concludes his talk about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, saying this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and let nothing move you. Now you know the rest of the story. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to consider what Jesus said to the sister of Lazarus. This woman who was distraught, who was heartbroken, seemingly hopeless, likely bound by fear, and uncertainty. Jesus came to her and said, you know, I'm the resurrection. I am the life. Whoever believes, whoever trusts in me, even if he dies, he lives. And in the very next verse, he asked her a question that I want you to ponder right now. He said, do you believe this? Do you believe this? We've talked about the resurrection of Jesus. How he presented himself. And the proofs that not only did he rise from the dead, but that he is alive today and forevermore. That he died on a cross for your sin and for my sin. 
And he stands now offering it to you and to me as a free gift. Do you believe that? Do you believe he died for you? Do you believe that you need to be forgiven of your sin? Do you believe that Jesus is alive today and offering you that gift freely because he paid for it? If so, would you receive that from him right now? We can already celebrate today as a church because one person gave their life to Christ in the first service today. But perhaps you're sitting there and you're thinking, you know, I need to make this decision for myself as well. So there's no need to wait. There's no need to put it off. There's no need to procrastinate or perhaps wait for a better opportunity. There is no better opportunity. This is it. This is the opportunity. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. So right now, would you pray with me and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of your forgiveness. I throw myself upon your grace today. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin that you were buried and rose from the dead. And now you are alive, offering me that very same gift, the gift of life. Not just physical life, but eternal life. I receive it from you right now. I accept you into my life as my Lord and my Savior. From this moment forward, would you help me to live a life that would bring you honor, that would please you, and cause others to want to follow you? Right now, again, with no one looking around, if you are praying that with me, accepting Jesus into your heart right now, trusting Him as your Lord and Savior, would you just simply raise your hand real quick so I know who I'm talking to? Real quick, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Are there others? I saw three. Anyone else? Real quick. Let me encourage those who are making that decision right now. Thank you, there's another. Let me encourage you. This is, this is a very private and, and transformative moment in your life. I, I know you may not realize it yet, just like a baby doesn't realize what all is going on in their life as soon as they're born. You know, the Bible calls salvation being born again. So I understand that, that you might not really understand what all is going on right now. But b- the Bible says that you have just been transferred from death unto life. You have now been granted eternal life in heaven. With your creator and savior. You have been given life that will never end. That's something to be proud of. That's something to celebrate. That's something to communicate to others. Your next step, listen to me very clearly. Is to move from this private moment to a public public proclamation. In other words, make it known. Not only tell someone, a friend, a spouse, a parent, but take your next step spiritually, which is baptism. We already have baptism sign-ups online, on our app. They'll be taking place the very last Sunday of this month, April 25th. Sign up today and identify publicly with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through baptism. That is why... We do is what we call dunking. Like we don't sprinkle you with water. We don't douse you with a little bit. You're going all the way under as if you were buried and rose from the dead, just like Jesus. Sign up for that. It's available in both services. New Life, I saw at least four hands here in this service. Let's give them a round of applause. Amen. Now let me pray for the rest of us as we uh, go to enjoy our day. God, we thank you so much for what you have done right here in our presence today. 
Not only in the first, but in the second service here as well. Or we read about your miracles, how you open the eyes of the blind, you cause the deaf to hear, you even, you even raise the dead to life. And we, we often read that and wonder, wow, wouldn't it be so incredible to have witnessed such a miracle? We ignore the fact that we often witness the most incredible miracle of all. And we've seen it taking place not once, not twice, but at least five times today right here at New Life Church where you have raised the dead to eternal life. And God, you deserve the glory and the honor for it all because it is only you through your death, burial, and resurrection that it is even possible to you be the glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope you guys have a great Easter and a wonderful week.